Hi, this is lesson 1.2 from Extended Calculus by Taylor and Shaw. More limits, continuity, intermediate value theorem, and graphing adjustments. That's what we're going to be looking at in this one. So some of you have done this in pre-calculus, but we want to look at this some more. If we want to find the limit, a lot of times we want to do direct substitution. So that's our number one option right there. What happens, though, is that a lot of times we get what we call an indeterminate form of 0 over 0. Then we want to use algebraic techniques to try to reduce these things, simplify them, bring them down, so that then we can do direct substitution at the end to find out what this limit is. So let's look at number 1. With number 1, if you notice straight away, I can cancel off this x. And so we rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over x plus 1. Now you can do a direct substitution. And when we do that, we're going to get, plug in 0 right there for the x, we're going to get 1 over 1, which is 1. That would be the limit that we want for this one. Number 2, looking at this, I think a lot of you can notice that you can factor and cancel this. So having factored the denominator, I get x minus 2 and x plus 2. And we can cancel identical factors, numerator, numerator, denominator, and we're going to be left with the limit as x approaches 2 of 1 over x plus 2. Now I can do a direct substitution, take this 2 and plug it in for the x there, and I'm going to get 1 fourth. So that would be my limit in my reduced form, and then I can figure out what it is. Now, I didn't mention this, but I should have, is that when I started off, if I plugged in the 2 in here and here, I would get 0 over 0. That's my indeterminate form. Same thing here. If I would have plugged in the 0 straight away, 0 over 0, indeterminate form. Number 3. With number 3, we see in the numerator that we have a difference of cubes. If you remember how to factor a difference of cubes, you would know that you would take the sign, plus and minus, would be the same as for this first factor, and then you get x squared minus the sum, uh, I'm sorry, the product of the two basic factors of the two, and then we get the last term, which would be a 1. Now, I did this wrong. This first term, if this is a minus, the second term over here has to be the opposite. So I did that one wrong, and so now i got to put a plus here. And then I divide this one out. This is over x minus 1. What I also forgot to do was write the limit. You always have to write this limit here. I think that that's always good practice. So now I can cancel these two off. And now I can do a direct substitution. If I do that, it looks like I get a 3. Plug the 1 into here. And here you get 3. Now for number 4. What we end up with for number four is the square root. When we see the square root, a lot of times what will happen to simplify uh, these things, what we'll do is we'll multiply by what we call the conjugate. So the conjugate pair for the square root of x minus 1 is the square root of x plus 1. And I have to multiply both denominator and numerator by that factor. And so what happens then is that if I take... It's all based upon a squared minus b squared is equal to a minus b, a plus b. These two are my conjugate pairs, and if I multiply those out and I get my result over here, I don't have that square root involved anymore. So in other words, I'm trying to simplify out the square roots. So when I do this, I get multiply these things, my middle term drops out, minus square root of x plus square root of x, and then I'm just left with x minus 1, which is a squared minus b squared. And then in the denominator, do not expand the denominator. Leave it as it is. It's so much easier just to do that. Because what I can do now is, if you notice, oh, nice, these two factors will cancel and so now I can do a direct substitution, 1 over the square root of x plus 1, and I'm going to get 1 half when I plug this 1 into there. All right? 
So conjugate pair, whenever you see these square roots, most likely you're going to be multiplying by its conjugate pair. And then that will help get rid of the square roots. You can simplify and cancel. Moving to number five now is that we have a right-handed limit. And with the right-handed limit, that means that I, I'm thinking, uh, how about 2.1? You're thinking that. You don't actually plug it in, but you, you do kind of in your mind to figure out what's going on. Now, if you look at this original, we do not have an indeterminate form. We do not have 0 over 0. So what happens is that I should be able to do a direct substitution. Well, I do get a vertical asymptote at x equal to 2. What that means then is that either my answer would be going to positive infinity or negative infinity. Either one of those, because it's a vertical asymptote. And so what I have to do is just figure out, am I positive or am I negative? And so when we think about this 2.1 and we plug it in, well, 2.1 in the numerator would be positive, and 2.1 plugged into the denominator would be positive. What is a positive divided by a positive? Well, obviously it is a positive. That's all you need to know. Determine the sign in and around the vertical asymptote, and that will tell you the direction that you are going to. So this could be a does not exist, but for graphical purposes and telling us what the curve looks like, we're going to tell you, hey, write down positive infinity. If you wrote down this, you'd probably be okay too. Multiple choice tests, I would say most often you're going to be seeing the positive infinity because we want to know what the graph is doing. So that's for one-sided limits. Number six, we need to discuss the continuity of f of x. Now what happens with this is that when I plug in three, this is going to be my point that I need to really look at and identify if I have a problem or not. The problem would be that my y value when I plug in the 3 into both of these would be two different things. If that's true, then I do get a non-continuous function. If they turn out to be the same thing, then I'm looking at a continuous function. But first of all, we do have a problem with this top function, so let's factor this one. So this would be x minus 3, x plus 1. And when we do that, we notice that we have a factor that can cancel. So this numerator is going to behave like x plus 1 everywhere except for at x equal to 3, and at that point we'll have a hole. So the question is, is does this x plus 1, when I take 3 and plug it in, does that match up with the y value over here on this other piece of the function? And the answer obviously is no. So what we have is the <coughs> limit as x approaches 3 of f of x is going to be 4. But then we also have that f of 3 is equal to 5. When these two do not equal each other, we are not continuous. And so what do we have here? Well, since the limit exists, I'm going to have a hole. And if we have a hole, then we know that we have a removable discontinuity. We can also look at the graph. Here's our graph right here. X plus 1 is graphed in blue, and then the point 5 is graphed in red. And so we do have a whole removable discontinuity at X equal to 3. So number 7 now really accentuates the point that when I plug in the 2 into this top piece and when I plug in the 2 into this bottom piece, I have to have the same y value. Well, this one tells me that I do have to have the same y value, so that's what I'm going to do. So you plug in x equal to 2 into both of these functions. And so I do this, and I plug in x equal to 2 into the other function. And what do I do with those two? To be continuous, they have to be the same value. So I set them equal to each other and solve. So what did this do for us? Well, if I have the x minus 3 function, then it's going to go all the way up to 2 and include 2. So I'm going to have that point right there, which would be 2, negative 1. 
Well, what's going to happen then is that this parabola that I have up here with an A value of negative 13, that means that it would probably start way, way down there. It's going to come up here. Now it's going to hit there, and then it's going to go up like that. And so then what I did was I hooked the two functions up at this point to negative 1 by making the A value work for when I plugged in a, uh, a equal to, um, sorry, uh, x equal to 2 into both functions. Okay, example number 8. We have number 8 here. Here's the graph. We want to look at two things. One says the limit as x approaches 1, and then the other one is x approaches 2. What happens to these two graphs? Well, as x approaches 1, what happens there is that we have a vertical asymptote. And I do have this example in the separate video for TI Inspire, so you might want to look at that, how to use your calculator and a table of values. But here I'm going to have a vertical asymptote, so when I do the limit for this one, I'm going to be going to positive infinity in one direction and then negative infinity in the other direction. And so what happens is that my limit does not exist. They're not the same infinity, so we just say DNE does not exist. Now if I look at what happens when we go to 2 here, I do get a value. And when what that value is, if you use your chart and then this other video on the calculator, you can see how we can go ahead and find that using that calculator. I can't do it in this program, so that's where I'm at. But you will find out that that would be a one-third. Also, so you would find out that that would be a hole in the graph. Although it doesn't appear on the graph, you would have to do some analysis of your factoring and canceling to make sure that you did figure out what that did. So this limit here is a does not exist. And then this limit here would be one third.